Hello everyone, this is uh, Casey from All Energies. I have not done a video in quite a while. Uh, for the past 10 years I've been pretty busy uh, building my off-grid solar business in West Texas. I uh, learned a lot over the years about uh, making a good off-grid solar system, especially in the uh, hot, arid uh, West Texas desert. So uh, today I'm going to do a video on off-grid inverters. Um, hopefully many more to come from this one. Uh, I just wanted to cover some of the popular makes and models. Uh, kind of what I have uh, around the workshop today to, to teach you all more about uh, a good off-grid inverter. Alright, so right in front of us is a Outback uh, VFX 3624. Uh, interesting thing about these inverters are they are really serviceable. When we first started uh, doing solar systems, I, I kind of thought the Outback stuff was gimmicky, ex you know, a bit more expensive than everybody else, and a lot of extra accessories. I didn't quite get it. But after using them from time to time and seeing others installed in the field, I've, I've grown to love them, and I really like these, um, these VFX series inverters. I'm not sure about the VFXR. I have yet to take one of those apart. Uh, they're the the new model that came out a few years back. Um, but I still there's still a ton of these VFX um, inverters out there. Parts are readily available. Uh, they're pretty nifty. They're easy to pull the boards. Um, you know, you can get this AC board out in just a few minutes. Um, this cover comes right off. Just a a really good unit. Very robust. The the failures I do see. It's usually a lightning strike. Uh, people who also have wind generators tend to have the highest number of uh, cooked inverters. Uh, sometimes I'll see a FET board go bad. Usually that's from wear and tear or possibly from uh, habitual overloading will cause the FET boards to go bad. FET boards, the single most expensive part, uh, I think they're around 350, uh, 350 bucks for a FET board. Just, that's just the cool thing about these, is they're really designed to be serviceable. It's really easy to get the components out. Everything that's in here is robust. So I've kind of become an Outback fanboy. Another inverter I really like and I don't have uh, to show you all today is uh, uh, Magnusine. Uh, they make really good stuff. Um, and to contrast, I have a Connext SW... Uh, SW2524. I haven't had too many problems with the 24 volt model, but they also sell a 48 volt model in the same case, uh, very similar. It's the uh, the 4024. Uh, that inverter's been pretty miserable. I've I've had more than half of them fail. I've sold 12, and I think I had seven fail. I've had the transformers cook, um, the FET boards cook. And another interesting comparison on, on like, let's say this uh, Schneider uh, versus the uh, the Outback here is the serviceability. These boards take a considerable amount of more time and, and care to get out. Um, they just basically found the lowest cost arrangement possible that didn't, you know, require any fancy tooling for the case. It was just, okay, we'll fit a board here, another one here, another one here. Eh, it works, but, and it's really, it's kind of, uh, it makes sense because uh, when they were selling these originally, the uh, promotional material they put out said, field serviceable. And that's a, that, as a um, an installer and integrator, I, I see that and I go, wow, someone's going to get a good value out of their product because they laid down, you know, 1500 or so on a, on, a, you know, a single component, they're going to want to you know, be able to replace a $200 board. It's, it's just, it's logical. Like, uh, for instance, the Outback is a field serviceable inverter. Um, this uh, ended up being, um, I would call Outback for, for parts and they said, I mean, excuse me, I would talk to Schneider Electric and they just said, no, no parts available, no parts available. So that was disappointing that they uh, promoted field serviceability and didn't follow through. Um... Some of the similarities, though, you see, pretty large inverter. Um, most of the weight 
excuse me, a pretty large transformer. Most of the weight is this transformer. Uh, there are about there are about forty pounds of transformer here. So that's where your weight is coming from. Uh, these inverters weigh overall, like the Outback weighs around sixty pounds, and I'd say forty five pounds is this transformer. Uh, this one's about fifty pounds, and I'd say about forty pounds is the transformer. So that's where your weight is. Uh, another good topic to cover is low frequency versus high frequency. So these two inverters are what's known as low frequency. Uh, they operate their transformer at a somewhat low frequency. Uh, it means it has to be heavier. Uh, it used to be an efficiency uh, uh, handicap, but now they're operating them at a higher lower frequency, sort of a compromise. They I'll do a video on high frequency versus low frequency later, but I just thought I'd cover some of that right now. So you have your heavy transformer. Uh, over here we have a high frequency inverter. And the vast majority of inverters out there, and the, especially the consumer level, are going to be high frequency inverters. Um, they're good for the right application. They are very light, which is great for portability. They are very cheap, which is good for people starting out or, you know, on a budget or whatever. It's, it's a good place to, to get your feet wet. Um, but there are downsides. Uh, they are light, but um, the other thing is they don't, they don't have a charger function, at least none of the ones I've seen. Uh, just... They also have very, very little startup uh, ability. The startup surge uh, milliseconds and the, the amount of startup surge they can handle is quite minimal. So um, this is a 1,500-watt inverter. It claims a 3,000-watt startup surge. Real world, it's more like, you know, 2,000, 2,500. And for not very long, that's one of the things. They also tend to be the high frequency inverters tend to be fragile. Um, there are some pretty robust ones out there, but this particular Kotec, anytime you went beyond its, its uh, beyond 3000 watts, it would cook. It wouldn't overload, it would cook the FETs, which are on this uh, heat sink right here. Uh, one of the other elements about these high frequency inverters that makes them so light is look at the transformer. Uh, that transformer probably weighs a pound. And this is a 1500 watt inverter. So it's driving the transformer at a higher frequency, but you, you just, you get less of the uh, flywheel effect out of this. Um, if you will, you just don't, you don't have that startup uh, surge. They just, and uh, so that's, that's one of the elements about high frequency. Uh, so less startup surge, really less continuous uh, rating also. But they're cheaper, so they have their place. They're good for like cabins and like and single loads. Let's say I was going to run, uh, maybe you know fans and a computer. I wouldn't even really want a continuous load on this inverter exceeding 500 watts, even though it's a 1500 watt inverter. In in most cases, the high frequency inverters are just overrated. Uh, going back to the low frequency, uh, you. You've got the ability to uh, charge your batteries, which is nifty. So essentially, you hook these up to a, a generator or a grid input, and you can uh, do a pretty pretty good size charge. Uh, this one does, I think, a 50 amp. Um, the Outback's right around there, too, at 24 volts. Uh, so that's nice to be able to do that when, when you have a generator running. Be able to charge your batteries, so it's kind of a dual purpose thing, uh, two in one. The other thing about these low frequency inverters, you're not just getting a higher surge capacity; you're getting more capability. Um, for instance, these stack. Uh, both of these units will stack. Um, you have, you know, control panels that do more. You can adjust the low voltage cutoff. Uh, remote monitoring is available for these. Uh, right from the manufacturer, um, battery temperature compensation through this port, pretty good stuff. So when you get into the the low frequency inverters, which is 
really where I guide most people's uh, solar systems is just start with a good inverter. Um, you're not going to regret it because, for instance, uh, a good inverter uh, like a, a a Schneider Electric XW series, which is about 130 pounds, or an or an Outback unit like this, or a Magnusine, you're going to get at least 10 years out of that inverter uh, treated properly. Of course, you know not in it. It's, that's pretty good. Uh, I've seen inverters out here that were over 20 years old. Uh, some of the old Trace uh, inverters. I'm trying to recall the, I think they were the UB series. They were they're incredible. Still humming away, uh, and just goes to show you that the right component can last a long time. Uh, these high frequency inverters, I wouldn't expect more than five years out of them, uh, and there's no field serviceability. So that's the other thing about them is there's no way you're gonna be just swapping boards out. And if you're really a skilled electronics person and you don't value your time too highly, you could spend, I don't know, 10, 20 hours, you could probably fix a high frequency inverter. Uh, it'd be interesting, but your, your, your best bet for an off-grid system is going to be a low frequency inverter. Uh, yeah, I guess that covers it for this, for this video. Uh, well, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please leave them down below. Uh, it's good to be back on YouTube. All right. Bye.